I think it's time to get started here. Welcome everyone to our session on understanding innovation in Next Gen Silk. I'd love to introduce our moderator for this session, Helen Za. Helen is the assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at RPI. She brings with her over 13 years of experience in protein and peptide-based materials. And her research at RPI focuses on the exploration of natural biomaterials and the synthesis of new biomimetic material technologies. Welcome, Helen. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me okay. Thanks for joining this session on Next Gen Silk. A little bit about the schedule of the session. We have three excellent panelists today and I will introduce them shortly. Uh, we will all have about five minutes or so to introduce ourselves and, and what we're doing. And then we'll have 25 minutes of panel discussion, then 15 minutes approximately of um, audience Q&A with the panel. Um, a little bit more about myself, um, just to get everything started. I am a chemical engineering professor with a material science background. Um, the research in my lab um, at Rensselaer, which is in upstate New York, if you don't, uh, not familiar with us, uh, focuses on creating synthetic materials using molecular building blocks that are inspired by or even derived from nature. Um, we use a range of chemical and biological tools to build materials from the molecular level with really an emphasis on controlling their properties by engineering these fundamental building blocks at that level of precision. Um, and we also have a high level of competency in using advanced characterization tools to examine the fundamental mechanisms that control materials properties from the nanoscale to the macroscopic scale. And to complement our efforts, um, we also work towards just generally gaining a deep understanding of the rules that govern natural materials, which are oftentimes extremely complex and multi-component systems. Um, so as an academic research group, we are really trying to push the boundary of scientific knowledge on biomimetic materials, but we do have a focus on creating innovations that solve you know, these grand challenges facing society, in particular for healthcare and sustainability applications. Um, and so some example projects uh, for my group that I'll mention on the Silk and Textile front, in case you want to ask me about it in a later network session is, for example, um, our lab is developing some microbial platforms that are new for producing bespoke protein products, including um, in silk. Uh, and we've recently developed, for example, a novel strain of E. coli that has 10 times higher production capacity than some conventional strains used. Uh, we're also working to develop bacterial strains that can metabolize waste plastic and upcycle this into high value protein products such as artificial silk and even uh, protein based dyes. Um, so that means we're, we're not only producing products that are inherently non-fossil um, based, but also are naturally biocompostable. And hopefully to address the waste plastic problem that, that comes from today's linear plastics economy. Um, in tandem with this work, we develop computational tools that help us predict the properties of our artificial recombinant proteins, which allows us to you know, achieve targeted properties in less time, hopefully, and less investment in experimental work. Um, and we also, actually just get our hands on real silk and really try to understand it at all levels. So uh, that's a little bit about where I'm coming from, but I'm, uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce to you our panelists, uh, which uh, span a range of industries um, and, and uh, really exciting to have them here and they're gonna get a chance to introduce themselves in more detail. Uh, so Darren, can I uh, introduce you first? We have um, Darren Abney from, get the screen out of, <laughs> I have multiple screens pulled up and I have to see the right screen, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have Darren Abney, who's Senior Business Development Manager at Lensing. And Darren, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and the company. Yeah, great, thanks Helen. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to come and speak here today with you all. Um, as you said, I'm a business development manager at Lensing Fibers. We are a wood-based cellulosic manufacturer. Uh, we're headquartered in Austria and we manufacture roughly 1.1 million tons of cellulosic fiber on an annual basis across eight different production facilities. Um, and my role at the organization is really to interface with retailers and brands, helping them to connect their supply chain who may or may not be interested in sourcing different types of materials. And typically with Tencel Lyocell, which is the brand that uh, I most frequently represent is really a fiber that I think a lot of brands see as a next generation solution at scale. So I look forward to diving into that more today, talking a bit more about that. Um, and I thought as a quick visual from, from forest to fiber to fabric, this is typically, 
if I was in person at like a trade show, I would show you this box that kind of gives you the idea of how wood-based cellulose are made when you start with the wood chips going down to wood pulp, which creates the actual fiber, which is then used in the industry where you're blending that into some different fabrics. So a uh, little show and tell this, this afternoon as we get started. <laughs> Thanks again. Great, thank you, Darren. Uh, Martin, I'm gonna call on you next. Uh, we have Martin Lunkis, who is Senior Product Manager of uh, Fiber Business at Amsilk. Well, uh, hello everyone. I hope you can understand me. Um, actually, I'm very closely based to the plant of, of Darren. I'm here in the southern part of Germany, uh, sitting one hour south of Munich and at the northern uh, base of the Alps. So uh, it's just a very small distance from um, our company to, to Lansing. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here on the panel discussion. Uh, my background is a textile engineer and I'm, I'm uh, serving the Amsel company as a product manager uh, since five years now. Um, and actually I came to the industry being a climber and uh, I was a climber back like in my, in my youth. And um, I was really keen to make products better. And uh, we started, um, I started at Patagonia and back in those days, it was about durability and making products last longer and be so more, you know, reliable. Uh, then at Gore, it was about breathability. So the, the, the performance shifted a little bit towards performance uh, values like breathability or waterproofness. And then followed by a decade of light is right, lightweight products are, are coming across and um, since a couple of years, I really sense like that the train has left the station towards a different performance. It's not just about durability or newtons or you know ounces. It's now about sustainability, and I'm really happy to be part of this panel discussion here. Great, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not least, I'll introduce Enrica Arena, who is CEO and uh, founder of Orange Fiber co-founder of Orange Fiber. Thanks so much. So I'm originally from Italy and from a different background. I come from political science and development cooperation. And back in the days in 2014, I co-founded this company with the core idea of transforming the leftovers of the juice industry into a material for fashion. And our really first uh, trial was with continuous filament and acetate really to uh, mini the, um, the silk somehow. And this was made with a partner in, in Spain that was later acquired by a US company. And uh, now we focus, then we went back to um, our cellular specs, I would say. And also thanks to a collaboration with Lansing Group, uh, we finally announced it in July, 2021, a new Tencel limited edition um, fiber containing both root pulp, root pulp and orange pulp. So we actually then uh, get back the fiber ourselves and transform it into a yarn and different fabrics with different weavers so we normally get down till the final client and we can either provide the fiber the yarn or uh, the fabric and we have established ourselves as an ingredient brand since day one and so we are also like trying to involve brands in this conversation with their final clients using our our trademark Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nika. So I think we wanted to start off to sort of address a very broad question, which is to get everybody sort of on the same page. And the, the topic is sustainability can be a very broad term, and it's kind of a buzzword that's that's really used a lot. And so I thought it would be good if we can each of the panelists describe what sustainability means to you. In particular, what aspects or concepts in sustainability would you consider to be the most important when it comes to next-gen textiles or next-gen silk-like textiles? And, and anyone can start on this if you want, or I can call on someone. I can go if you want. <laughs> Thank you. So when we started, the concept of sustainability that we embraced was really to reuse a leftover from the food industry, so finding an alternative source from cellulose. But this concept uh, really evolved in the last eight, 10 years for us, but in general for the industry. 
So I think the focus now is really much on the whole life cycle assessment of the process, but also on the use phase and the end of life phase. So it has shifted completely. So for instance, now we are focusing on not blending with um, uh, plastics origin sources so that we can uh, uh, like have different options for the fabrics but still not releasing microplastics or having better options for recyclability later on so i think the whole concept of sustainability uh, evolved with the company and so we are trying to uh, implement it even if we have are really at a small scale currently we make uh, pretty much one ton every month uh, so it's also quite hard when you have a linear system that works in batch to have a closed loop uh, pro like process that is comparable with existing industrial uh, processes so for us sustainability is on one hand on the scale up industrialization but also as we deal with the final client how we uh, make sure they take care of the product in the right way and maybe they have the right information when it would come to the end of life. Go, go um, ahead, Martin. Well, for me, sustainability by the definition of the word is if, if something runs in a circle, in an infinite circle, and uh, on the contrary, as you said, it's like the linear industry and um, as we all know, plastic recycling is working to a certain extent, but it's not infinitive by, by definition because oil is not infinitive. And uh, you can, recycling means they do make a product that has the same quality before uh, as before. So you are, you are not downgrading it uh, technically. And we all know that there are limitations. Um, so there is no real circularity uh, on fossil-based products. And we, uh, our company believes that uh, we are having a closed green loop. That means we are starting uh, from biomass and our product ends up as biomass. And the process in between, um, we really take care to have uh, a minimum CO2 footprint and water consumption. Um, and that's for us uh, a sustainable process uh, by definition. And as Enrica said also, we are not leaving, leaving any microplastic behind because our uh, silk is fully biodegradable in marine conditions and also like in aerobic conditions in, in the soil. Thanks, Martin. Darren? Yeah, I, I would say that as the as the American on the panel that um, as humans, we have a tendency to be very selfish and very focused on what my needs are, right? So the idea of sustainability in definition, I think is really about meeting today's needs while not compromising your ability to meet future needs for future generations. I mean, I think about what the impacts of the world today are for my children and grandchildren one day, and, and it's, it's a little scary and daunting. So. I think that what's happened over the last decade plus is companies are really looking at their raw materials as not so much a sustainability strategy from a marketing perspective, but they're really looking at it from um, a raw material perspective and ensuring the continuation of their 10, 20, 50 years from now. So I think that, you know, this, this specific topic for next gen silk and the session that we're in today, really looking at next gen um, innovation for materials, I think um, sustainability is becoming more and more important and there's more investment in the research of different viable options out there. Um, so it's exciting to get to be part of the, the, the conversation. I mean, we're, we're Tencel is now at a 30 year anniversary. Um, it went to market in 1992. So it was kind of dawned at that time as the next generation fiber. And I, I think it has grown in commercial success, but um, you know, there's a lot more that we're doing and trying to do in, in the future. A example being the collaboration with Orange Fiber. Great, thanks. I think this is a lot of good stuff. I do want to follow up like, kind of on this. And I think Martin said something interesting when, in his introduction is sustainability is sort of a metric of performance, which is a, a new thing in addition to the you know prior metrics, people like durability and et cetera. So in, in each of your opinion, what is 
you know, what are the most important measurable metrics you know of sustainability like name like two or something i know there's there's a lot of options but well, it, you know, things like it depends it depends which industry you are uh, you are uh, representing uh, if you're coming from a fossil fuel uh, a fossil fuel based industry you would probably would uh, take like the lca uh, uh, hic index because it's all about you know uh, CO two footprint like global warming uh, um, capacities. Uh, products like like ours on this panel discussion here is biodegradable, and there's I mean there's no space in an LCA equation for biodegradability. So for us LCA is a part of the game, but it's not entirely like the truth because uh, where is the stuff coming from, and where is the stuff going? Uh, only the LCA is only ca capturing like the middle in between the process, but it leaves out uh, the ability of biodegradability and biomass uh, as, as a feedstock. That's a great point. Yeah. I, I saw the study that I think was released today or yesterday about the microplastic study in human blood and that 80% of participants, they found substantial volume of microplastics in the blood system, which I think is a surprise. You know, you think of the digestive, what we've known about and, and breathing it in for years, but um, it's a growing concern for a lot of people and it's going to have impact and regulation. And I know that specifically in the EU, in the next three to five years, there's an enormous volume of regulation that, that companies are preparing for. So it's really taking it beyond the individual um, desires or, you know, us as people wanting to do better and be better, I think it's really going into legislation where it, it needs to go um, in terms of having those metrics of accountability. It is going to vary from water to chemical use to everything in between, but really understanding what those metrics are for us as a society and then businesses to be able to successfully operate within those models. Um, yeah, we're seeing that change now. Hmm. I think for from our perspective, uh, awareness raising is also one metric. Uh, I think people have been desensitized for a long time uh, about the materials, where they come from and how they need to be cared and disposed of. So if you like have a look at the fact that 30 to 40 percent of what is produced apparently is never even gets sold and get wasted right away. Mm -hmm. Then there's also a big issue in the global supply chain about how uh, like low some products cost and how they are on the other hand very dangerous for our environment in every single part of their production and disposal. So what we are also trying to do is to get a lot of people involved and close to the concept that sometimes uh, the high cost of a product and in general reading the label and trying to understand what is implied in the building up of every product is actually an investment they are making in a better tomorrow. And in that direction, I think that the implementation of uh, circularity passport or a material passport, it's very relevant because this can, uh, I mean, put a lot of information together. And I think every consumer at the end of the day also decide uh, depending on, uh, yes, social principles, but also personal principles. So animals are implied, animals are not implied. Uh, marine life is endangered, maybe not. Uh, what's the logistics? So each of us, also had some very uh, personal and specific takes. So our our uh, our angle is also to make as much uh, information available as possible to the final client so that they can make informed choices, not just on our material, but in general on the production of materials. Great, thank you. I think this is a good lead into another topic I wanted to discuss, which is transparency and authenticity and verification of sustainability claims. I think these mentions of um, material passport, circularity passport is really interesting. So how, how, what are your opinions on how to scale these innovations, these materials innovations credibly? Um, and, and if you have any examples, you know, either from your own company or otherwise, that'd be great to talk about. If I can jump in, I would say that traceability is right up there with concerns for companies along with circularity. Um, transparency, especially everything that's happened in the last two years 
with uh, Xinjiang cotton out of China and the world's response to that and the complexity of a cotton supply chain. I, I think that's really just pushed companies who weren't maybe thinking about it um, five years ago to really consider it because of the legal implications. But in reality, when you think about a complex supply chain like the textile industry um, and the ability to trace from origin to end of life and maybe even past the consumer, what the implications are, I think it's, it, it's uh, a little bit overwhelming and it's probably the single greatest area of growth in the, la in the next 10 years. Um, I think that I'm fortunate to work for a company that produces their fiber with tracers, DNA markers embedded into the fiber from the beginning. It's a completely different industry than something like cotton, where you, you have a commoditized product that's grown in multiple different countries, but then you're producing in specific facilities. Having that marker, I think, travel with the end product so that the brand can actually test the fiber and if it's present or not in the end product and they can make claims around that. Um, is invaluable. I've seen a really positive response from our retail brand partners on that. But in general, for the industry, I think we've also become desensitized to greenwash. People would latch onto buzzwords just to sell a product that may or may not be true. And when those companies get caught, there are serious ramifications to their, their reputation. So I don't think anyone today, most brands are not out there willingly saying the wrong thing. If anything, they're scared to say something about a product because they want to make sure that they have watertight uh, verification that the claim associated with that is accurate, whether it be water savings or carbon offsets or, or whatever it may be that's of interest for them in their business. But it is critical. And I think that the evolving, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll I, I could go on for a long time, but this is, I feel <laughs> sorry, but I'll just say um, before I pass off to my, my panel, other panelists here, that I think that the certification systems that we've relied on for physical segregation in the supply chain for the last 20 plus years um, is evolving. And I believe that there has to be some radical change within that because in audits are always important and they're going to be, I think, important, but as we digitize and look at new technologies like blockchain, um, there's a whole new frontier. Great, thanks. Uh, Anika or Martin, any thoughts on this? Well, maybe I can jump in here real quick. Uh, it's, it's a complex one and uh, it's all about education, uh, I believe. Um, and I, I think I've heard that, uh, Enrica, you also in, uh, working on an ingredient brand model uh, same as for Lansing. So I think all three panelists here are having an ingredient brand model. That means we are um, not selling our product to everyone, but we're selling products to, to brands who have a great fit in terms of, you know, uh, transparency and also interest uh, to make better products for, for a better world. And uh, over time, I think the branding model and the selection of partners who are uh, communicating transparency and what's really going on um, to, to the best knowledge uh, is, is our approach to, to not greenwash, but to make a solid and also sustainable business. Sustainable for us is also not having something on the short term view, but having like multiple decades of businesses. And, and um, only 5% of the global companies are uh, get, celebrating 100 years anniversary. The rest is gone before. So this is also about sustainability. And if you want to be a, a long-term performer, you have to be transparent and honest. Thanks. Nika? Uh, well, no, I, I totally agree with what has been said before. And just on our side, we are trying to see different options. Of course, working with Lansing, there's something embedded, but there are also solutions on the market that are uh, DNA adds on to the fiber that you can make or a classic QR code or NFC. And I think now there are a lot of early adopters, but uh, for instance, in the European Union, it looks like it will be uh, compulsory by 2025. So uh, I think uh, this is really coming very quickly. So the earlier we start uh, measuring and comparing, uh, the, the quicker we will be ready on that. Uh, and of course, uh, educating and explaining the clients 
what what that looks like is very important. And last but not least, I think for all of us, uh, avoiding counterfeiting is also a big part of uh, the equation when it comes to uh, sustainability and traceability. I mean, we found so many <laughs> different orange fiber on the market, and uh, it's like okay, this is not us. And it's weird because these products uh, actually arrive with the same name and uh, they are imported and it's not even stated uh, which is the real composition. Like for the European Union, you should say if it's lyocell or viscose or whatever, and it just comes as orange fiber, but clearly it's not uh, natural fiber, so it cannot follow that kind of naming. So uh, I also hope that this kind of uh, digital uh, and and DNA traceability of fibers and products can help avoid because at the end of the day the one which who is tricked is the final client. So the the middle person it is, but what the the message we are passing over to the final client is that they are having a product which is not what they they think they are buying, mm -hmm. and this is very. I mean, for us, it's very sad because we have people coming and saying, oh, this, I've bought this from you, but maybe we don't like it. It's like we never actually produced it. So right. uh, I think it's also quite relevant for all of our company to have a way to prove uh, what products are actually made uh, using our values and process and which are not. Great. Thank you. So I think you know, it's interesting, all of these innovations and technologies that definitely value added, but they do come at a cost, I mean, financially, right? Um, and so one question I have is how, how might we balance these sort of materials innovations with the added cost of, you know, the, the end result? Um, what kinds of maybe market factors can help with commercial viability? Martin, go ahead. You're muted. Innovation is always something that is more costly. I mean, uh... Just by definition, uh, if you if you compare yourself as a startup making a couple tons a year with an industry that does like multiple millions of tons a year, uh, then of course it, that's a different cost level. And uh, but for every industry, the same thing also uh, is applicable. Uh, there are early adopters; they are valuing the product, and they are able and willing to pay a, pay a higher price. Our first customer that we worked with and uh, we made a product that was commercial on the market was Omega. Um, you know, the famous uh, Swiss watch uh, company that does the, the watches for James Bond since a couple decades. And the watch is a couple thousand dollars, right? And so um, it's not a commodity product, but the brand fit was great and they could afford to uh, innovate or, or demonstrate innovation by, by com uh, using our fiber, which was uh, obviously not comparable to polyester or polyamide at, at that point of time. And uh, we are sure that over time with, with the uh, scales of economy, uh, prices will come down to, to a broader audience. Thanks, Martin. And I would say that innovation is also not just focused. I know we're focused here today on sustainability and that's really the core theme, but when the textile industry is looking at innovation, they're really trying to also push the boundary on the performance of the actual product, which today I would say there's more innovation across different product categories than we've ever seen from denim to home goods to footwear. Um, and I think that innovation like Martin rightfully said, someone always has to foot the bill. If it's new and different, then there's going to be a cost to it. It's not something that um, I would say that also what we said earlier is true, that you're really trying to look at the long-term innovation of your company and what you're able to deliver to the market. So if you build that into your business process, that's one thing, but there's definitely a cost to it. Um, and I would also say that trying to find a, a, the balance of scale, because that's ultimately the goal of a business is to make money and do it for the right reasons, hopefully. And I know that's true for everyone that's on this panel and probably attending this conference today, just because um, that's really where everyone's being pushed to and what they know the business models need to adapt to, but trying to find ways to, to balance that innovation in a way that meets consumer needs is really the key. Great, thank you. Uh, Anika, anything yeah. to add? Yeah, well, 
we we are way more expensive. I would be super interested to see how like tensile compared to other fibers uh, back uh, thirty years ago when they were launched and how many quant which quantities and how it has changed over time to have a benchmark. But I think what we are also trying to convey uh, is. Uh, if you are buying, uh, I don't know, cotton for uh, less than one euro per kilo, there's something wrong if it takes much water and if it takes so much logistics. So we are also trying to uh, put the, like, is it exactly where we want to go to have a competitive uh, pro like price on the market that actually enable overproduction and over waste? Or we want to keep a price that uh, adds a value to that garment that make maybe makes you want to uh, take care of it and pass it over. Because I think that's also the big dilemma of starting a company right now is we really want to aim at being super competitive in price or uh, we want to, I mean, uh, trying to set a different way of uh, doing business given that we will never be competitive with cotton or maybe with whiskers anyway, but most likely not even with Sander Pencel. Uh, and not the limited edition. So because of the quantities and because, I mean, it will take 30 years, most likely, and maybe not even. So uh, maybe we should find different uh, business models for our costing and for the clients to make them know that uh, 5 euros or 10 euros for a final garment means someone else is paying the price of what you're wearing. Yeah, you're definitely right, Enrica. And if you, if you see on the fast fashion companies in Europe, there are statistics that only uh, two thirds are worn, like one third is never worn. So it's just purchased and thrown away. So the stuff has no value at all to the consumer. It's just, it's just nothing at all. And that has to stop, I think. Great. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, so I, I should just mention to everyone that we will have the Q&A following this general discussion. So you can go right ahead and already start typing your questions in the box and, you know, we'll accumulate some and, and get to those shortly. So don't feel like you have to hold off on, on typing your questions in the chat. Um, okay, so I think the last, maybe the last, I imagine this is going to be a big topic <laughs> we want to talk about is but where, where do you see the biggest technical challenges, or they don't have to be technical, they could be infrastructural or regulatory. The biggest challenge facing the development and commercialization of these next gen silk-like textiles um, for you. Maybe you can also start here because there's a question from Tiffany uh, about um, biotechnology and, and you know, uh, the kind of uh, starting point when it becomes large. Yeah. Um, yes. Technological barrier that will unlock scale. And, and I mean, we are we are exactly we have this challenge, uh, or in the beginning we had the challenge because if you do biotech products, you have either two groups: you can do very small quantities to extremely high prices, pharmaceutical products, or you do very cheap products at uh, a very low quality, like you know, uh, uh, feeds for for animals, uh, fishes, etc. We are in the middle of in between, so we need something at a certain quality to a certain price. And there is not really equipment available uh, that does uh, what we need actually to produce a good quality at a fair price. And that was one of our biggest challenges. And to Tiffany's question, um, uh, last year we already did multiple tons of silk proteins for the cosmetic industry. And uh, we are planning to do next year also multiple tons for the fiber industry. So we have reached now uh, the tipping point where we can scale up the fermentation processes, the upstream and downstream processes. But that was really a challenge for us to, to scale it up. Absolutely. I'm also familiar with this field and I can vouch for the, <laughs> the challenges and scale up of fermentation with these, these proteins. Yeah, and I think that's uh, somehow our same barrier and we share it with a lot of innovators. Like if we want to work, for instance, on cellulose extraction, uh, getting access to semi-pilot facilities is virtually impossible. Uh, so either you build your own or you work with universities, but for us has been quite hard to find uh, maybe a pulping company or another company that can uh, enable us to use their own machinery and on on like uh, as a result, uh, you are stuck in a, in a middle where uh, you need to 
fundraise, but fundraise for machinery that you never tried is quite hard, at least for uh, the Italian ecosystem. And so it's like, okay, we have proved there's a market. We know that like we made some partnership, but uh, what will be next is quite hard to, to figure out because there's no, uh, I mean, we, we couldn't find uh, one place that you, for instance, rent and you try your own process there. And it's uh, like there for trials on a real industrial scale. So not on a few kilo scale, but on a Tom scale. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think I'm saying a secret, but in the cellulose man-made fiber, the, the classic run, it's around 100 ton per day. So having access to cellulose uh, facilities or even fiber making facilities has been the main limit and still will be for a few years. If we have a look at what uh, Red Newsel, for instance, doing in, in Sweden, they raised like 80 million to revamp an existing pulping mill. And uh, so they are also leveraging on some know-how that was available in the region and internally and some machinery that were already in place. But uh, imagining to get there as a startup uh, without that ecosystem is quite hard. So I think it's a mix of uh, infrastructure, meaning a production site and also access to investment. Yeah, it sounds like this is sort of a a, a, a bridge or a gap that needs to be bridged, essentially. <laughs> Darren? Yeah, I, well, and, and in terms of challenges and, and technological challenges that are associated with our industry, I think it's helpful to think about the framing of um, how much fiber is actually used and what types of fiber are used, knowing that roughly 110 million tons of fiber are consumed every year for the textile industry. And 68% of that is synthetic, whether it's polyester, nylon, whatever, that's, that's a large portion. And that's happened over the last decades or, or years, I should say, because of uh, performance attributes, cost attributes, scalability, ease of performance. There, there's a whole host of reasons. And I've heard a lot of those arguments in the, in the cotton sector. But um, if you look at wood-based cellulose, that's only 6% of the total pie. So when you have 68% that's synthetic, about 21% or so is cotton, um, and then also include wool and you know all of the other protein-based uh, fibers that are circular, that are, you know from nature back to nature, um, and is going to become an, a growing importance. I think that still finding those scalability metrics to be able to do that is going to be a challenge for the industry. Um, one of the things that we've been really focused on too is finding alternative inputs for our material. I mean, we use only FSC and PEFC certified wood for creating the, the, the fiber that we create today. But um, looking at our Refibra technology, which incorporates cotton scraps, um, basically, if you're not familiar with the process, it, you know, you, you take a cellulose, you melt it down basically into a dope and create a virgin fiber that doesn't compromise on the quality that the industry demands. So basically you're using a feedstock that combines what we use today and trying to find ways to scale that. I would say the biggest challenge there honestly has just been finding the material. There's a lot of trash out there, but getting it at the right place at the right time at the right quality is a whole nother challenge. Um, and I think we're going to get there because there's so many industries that are pushing toward that same direction, but it's, it's messy. It's not easy. So there's a lot of education that's also, I think, a big challenge that we're facing um, within our industry and beyond, um, lawmakers included. Yeah, so I think that is really interesting about the, I, I don't know, Tiffany, is not really the lack of suitable upstream raw materials, but maybe just reliable, consistent um, upstream raw materials, right? Um, Okay, I think we can start fielding some of these questions from the audience and feel free to keep rolling them in. Um, so Craig asks, how much of the cost difference is based on these issues of scale um, and how much is based on the unpriced externalities of traditional manufacturing models? And I know many of you don't use traditional manufacturing in, in, in your processes, so, but this is a really good question. Well, I mean, pricing's on everyone's mind all the time, but particularly in the last two years because of all the disruption that we've had in supply chain with transportation issues, logistics around the world. Um, I have brands that are coming to me saying, 
my supplier is telling me it's going to be 20% more because it's your fiber instead of the generic fiber. Well, is that really the case? Because when I look at the, the markets for fiber prices right now with other competing fibers, um, it, it, there's really not a price difference. That's an easy scapegoat to say, oh, a branded fiber, that's, that's the extra cost. When in reality, that supplier may be facing a lot of energy crises. Um, they may be facing a lot of transportation upcharges. And I mean, it's all in the news. We're all reading it regularly. Um, so that's kind of a more of a meta idea to put out there behind that pricing conversation more specifically um, to address that question. When you're looking at of manufacturing, there are differences to take into consideration. And when you get to scale, I, I will say it is easier. Um, and, and Enrico, what you were saying earlier about, you know, 30 years ago when Tencel started versus pricing today. Yeah, for sure there's a difference. I mean, we just opened up a facility in Thailand that's pumping out 100,000 tons of Tencel Lyocell on an annual basis starting this year. That's gonna have an impact on the market in some way. We're not sure quite yet what, but the proximity to market being in Asia for the first time. Um, yeah, there's gonna be some impacts. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what the costs are for 25 million tons of microplastic every year. Uh, I don't know. So pricing is always a question where you start and where you end the when the where the calculation ends. And uh, uh, there's a certain price to everything. And as, as Darren uh, described, I mean, uh, two thirds are really synthetic fibers and we don't have like a true solution at the end of life for the products. We can downcycle it maybe once or twice and then what to do with the stuff, you know? Right. Uh, that's it's definitely a good point. I think people need to obviously be more aware of that. Um, Indica, any thoughts about this? Yeah, I think scale is really uh, a big component. I mean, again, I totally agree with that. what has been said. For us, is even uh, the process itself, so starting with a raw material that is not so rich in cellulose, for sure uh, has an impact. I mean, there's a reason why it's mostly extracted from food. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I see Darren when he said find the right uh, feedstock to also keep the product on the market and competitive and being uh, reliable and consistent because the, we faced a lot of issues with the different uh, uh, like ways in which orange squeeze can present itself, whether it's uh, tried in iron, uh, in iron, like, um, uh, how you say, uh, okay, I cannot find the name Owen like and there's a lot of contamination of irons which is not in the pill for instance but you end up having it in the final product or different way of squeezing it so uh, the biomass per se it's a quite complex uh, input so the process in itself uh, it's more expensive and of course the scale is having a big impact but uh, I totally agree also with Martin that uh, uh, cost is not just what we are paying per kilo, but it's also the general impact that we are having. Well, yeah, and, uh, I, sorry, Helen, I, go ahead. I was going to say, I think this is also addressing Tiffany's question about feedstock contamination, or um, I don't know if that's the, the, the term, but um, reproducibility, maybe. Right. Yeah, go ahead, I mean, Darren. There's so much waste in the industry. I mean, Refibra, the, the, it's, it's a technology that's blending, right, cotton scraps, basically. And you have to have a high volume of cellulose in the product. So if you have a, if you have a t-shirt that's 50 polyester, polyester, 50% cotton, that's not going to work for the process that we use necessarily. There's plenty of it out there. And I don't want to mislead when I say reliable and consistent source, because we, we do have some key partners, Pulp Mills, uh, Sodra, that's out of um, Sweden. We signed a, and announced a partnership with them last year. They supply a large volume of stock, and we have plenty of Refibra available. When we launched it five years ago, honestly, I think lensing was a little bit ahead of the curve because we expected there to be a bigger commercial response from the retailers and brands around this, this product. Um, and... I'll just say that we have plenty of availability. Um, we, we've produced enough to more 
produce more than 4 million t-shirts. Um, so there's a lot of supply that's out there. It's just a matter of being willing to pay for something that sounds like it shouldn't be more expensive, but ultimately it is because of the logistics that are associated with it when you're trying to ship things around, get them to the right place um, at the right time. And there was something else that was mentioned in the comments. Oh, the feedstock contamination. Yeah, that's something that I think in our space um, is really key to watch. And we work with some really reliable partners to help us with that pulp that we source. Um, we've also opened up our own facility um, just this last month in uh, South America to be able to diversify our pulp supply. So we continue to look at that growth and what's, what's being done. But um, yeah, I'll stop at that. Great, thank you. Any, any other thoughts or comments on this? We have some interesting questions coming in. Uh, so Craig says it's, it's dangerous to assume that just because materials are natural in origin that they are environmentally benign and there's an evidence of natural fibers like cellulosic or animal-based in marine sinks. So biodegradable ability may not be as straightforward as you know we commonly like to assume. So um, maybe you can comment on the work that you have done or, or would be interested in doing in terms of ensuring certain levels of degradation for your materials. I don't, I don't want to hijack the whole conversation, but for sure, for lensing, we regularly test our fibers to be not just biodegradable to your point, but also compostable in multiple different environments. So that can be anything from marine to fresh water to soil. Um, I know that there uh, recently it was a conversation with a brand asking about the biodegradability in landfill if there's a lack of oxygen, because you think about how that works and there's testing around that that we've also done to make sure that the fibers do biodegrade. There's also a lot of different chemistries and, and processes associated with the manufacturing of these products that are natural in origin but are really important scope of production for the industry to be aware of and we also focus on that and I think that's where honestly Tencel got such a, a good reputation in the last 20 years before 30 years um, has been around the closed loop processes where we recycle 99.8% of the solvent and water to that process. We don't say 100% because there's natural evaporation that occurs, but being aware of all of those processes associated with any of your fibers, I think is really critical. I don't know if you can see this. This is a, a silk cocoon from a mulberry silkworm, and this is made from pure amino acids, uh, and it biodegrades. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it's just made out of, like our meat, out of amino acids. Uh, and that system is relevant since, since millions of years. And our product is made exactly the same way. It's congruent. So our product is made completely 100% from amino acids forming uh, the fibrin, uh, like the, the silk um, polypeptide. And... Um, there are, there's a caveat to it. Customers are asking for colors, for example. Yeah, great story, fantastic, but can we dye it? And can we dye it in a way that it's color fastness to UV light, to sweat, to water endlessly for 10 years? And then the stuff starts to become critical because dye stuffs who are doing such a high performance will not be biodegradable. So it's possible, but the market sometimes is crying for uh, compromises already. So, but uh, silk or wool uh, from a sheep, which is also a structural protein, is without any question uh, biodegradable. I, I think the field of biodegradable dyes is a hugely rapidly <laughs> uh, hot topic. Um, Indica? Yeah, but uh, I wanted to circle back on the uh, Refibra uh, mentioned earlier on, because I think it's also quite confusing for the final client sometimes to navigate different fibers. So how it is better to have uh, recycled cotton or organic cotton or better cotton or so I think also in this space, a lot of education is needed and then for the final clients and the brand. So uh, a lot of work has to, to happen there. 
And the, for biodegradability, we will do the classic uh, tooth test on the fiber, assuming they will perform um, as a tensile, standard tensile, given that the purity of the cellulose is, uh, that we input is quite comparable. Uh, but uh, uh, Martin is right, then uh, what about uh, finishing and what about uh, printing? So the, the final goal is that there's no need for biodegradation if not for the microfiber uh, released during wash. So we don't really wish this to go to landfill, but we wish that there might be solution for chemical recycling or mechanical recycling at the end of the cycle. And we can just... Uh, I mean, be less impactful when it comes to the washing, the washing streams and the production stream. I mean, I don't really believe in people having uh, a garment in their compost outside. I hope we will get there one day. But if we have a look at what at the situation right now, there are just not enough facilities to make a garment biodegradation happening. So, I mean, the the, the wall. Uh, industry have to set up a uh, solution for that as well because otherwise all all the biodegradability claim will come to a point where yes but where i mean we, we are starting from oranges oranges are uh, biodegradable but if you have seven hundred thousand tons of oranges in three months then uh the, that biodegradation will uh, go into a like dangerous path anyway Right. I think that's a good point. I think um, I, I give the example of PLA to a lot of people. It is biodegradable, but only under very strict conditions. And unless you have the infrastructure to handle it, it's just as bad as normal plastic. Uh, OK, we have a really interesting question from Jessica, who says that she's been told that the domestic forestry industries in northern European regions are interested in cellulosic fibers as a means of product diversification. So do other feedstock partners like agricultural and food industries need to be more proactive in supporting this field or is it already happening? Are they are they key players or, you know, coming on board? Well, I can elaborate on that. But the one that we work with at the very beginning were not very collaborative. They were like, okay, you can take all the waste that you want, but don't, not ask us to invest or to process them in any ways because we have a certainty, which is the price of disposal and investing into a different solution. Uh, we don't understand because most of them are very aware of the food industry, but not or any other uh, material industry. Uh, we're not uh, leading us anywhere. And we ended up partnering with a company that specializes in um, food ingredients. So they do some extraction that are a little bit more complicated than just squeezing. And they have come as a big support of our company. But in general, um, for our experience in Italian ecosystem, the, the food producer and the, the juice squeezer are, are very open to, to give the weights, but not really uh, still uh, playing a role in stabilizing the feedstock or, uh, I mean, make one part of the work done. I would say that there's definitely business for Tincel, for, for lensing in agricultural practices. We produce some of the fibers because of the biodegradability and compostability. They're used in lieu of um, some traditional plastic methods. If you have like, if you're tying up certain crops or you're bagging certain crops, things like that, there's been a small business for us in that, but that's not what you're asking. I'm not really sure about the forestry um, industry in Northern Europe and what you may be referring to that they're interested, like they're inter interested to produce cellulosic fibers as an alternative um, to their business or are they looking for something that's a product? I'm not sure what that, what that first part means. I think I can maybe provide an example. So in North America, we, we now have, not now, but we, we have a lot of hemp sort of coming on the market because it's getting more and more accepted and regulations that have loosened. So, and so there's a question of, can we use hemp, you know, waste from the, the, the hemp industry to create sustainable plastics? And the answer that I've been sort of kind of understanding over time is um, it may not be the right strain of hemp <laughs> to give you the material properties that you need uh, that is being grown. And it may not interest the growers to give you the waste in the fashion that you want to receive it in. So I think the 
the best way forward is, you know, even on the, the early, you know, materials innovation side, even as far as the university level, is to find the suppliers early and work with them to see what, what really is out there, what can they give you, um, and, and match the innovation, the technologies to that, rather than saying, oh, here, I've developed this material, but it needs a certain agricultural waste stream that is not going to be actually materialized, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a natural tension between innovation and scalability where, you, where companies want to scale to make the innovation work. But sometimes you have to, it's like that, that natural uh, pull between the two. And so next gen materials for sure, but I know that we are particularly interested in, um, in continuing with uh, more sustainable forestry, sustainable wood, and then um, waste streams. So looking to scale that because we know there's more and more waste uh, just means more feedstock. Great. Let's see if I missed any questions. Uh, Tiffany asked, can, can raw material industry be swayed to the apparel and textile industry? As Enrica mentioned, is the processing technology may, may be a gap. Well, I think uh, they, they might be, uh, I don't know, I really don't know, but I think they might be involved somehow. So I've seen, for instance, for from Fashion for Good, um, there was an initiative to actually uh, involve a number of agricultural waste streams to see if there was some cellulose that could be extracted from their uh, byproducts. So I think there, there, this kind of connection is now in the making when it comes to agricultural leftovers for the rest. I really uh, don't, I mean, I think uh, bioplastics and the rest, I, I really don't know. Yeah. Well, I think the last question I would like to ask you and it's personal interest of mine is, um, where do you see the role of basic research? Like, you know, for example, really, really fundamental stuff at university level. Um, is there a role for it in, in helping address some of these technological challenges that are facing the field? And maybe I specifically want to hear from Martin because I know you closely collaborate with um, a research group. Well, we have to, uh, we have to, because uh, what, what we do is, I don't know if it's familiar to the audience, but we, uh, we do material in a biotechnological, biotechnological way. So we are, we are working with bacteria and they're producing our protein that we then spin into fibers. And this is a technology that is available on this planet since 10 years. It was not uh, possible to do stuff like this before. And of course we are working and we have to work with universities and we have to get our processes uh, better and more efficient. And um, so we are definitely have the need for material science. And um, I'm in this industry now since uh, more than 20 years and uh, you can see, especially also in big companies, there's a lack of technical understanding. So if you talk to a big company, um, there, there is a very few people are capable of textiles in general. So it's a huge, humongous industry, but there's a very small amount of specialists. So um, uh, that's why we definitely have to, to work with universities and, you know, people who are um, you know, at, at the beginning um, of, uh, you know, uh, material science for sure, because we cannot, we can hardly relay on any customer. Uh, there's, there's not so much brain power. I'm sorry to say this. I mean, you, I, I <laughs> totally agree with what you're saying about scaling and, and the need for research is going to do nothing but increase at partnerships with different universities as an example, but definitely and that goes from everything that we're talking about with materials all the way to basic construction of materials, basic textile engineering. It's funny that, you know, you'll, what you would have like true designers within brands and retailers um, 20 years ago, and that still exists today. I don't want to belittle that, but a lot of times, um, oops, uh, I saw the, the networking thing come up. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're coming to our last minutes. Okay, yeah, so there is a need for it is my short answer. Enrica? 
Yeah, like definitely. I mean, and we are dealing with an industry that has no R&D in Italy since 20 years because we don't have manufacturing in, in Italy. So we are working with Finland or with Germany or with uh, Austria. Or, or, but there's no, there's also like kind of a lack, even if we are a big manufacturer of textile as Italy, but of knowledgeable uh, R&D people, uh, we have to find where forestry is at the, at the current moment. Great. Well, thank you very much for all your insights. Um, I think all of you hopefully will be around for some of the networking. So we encourage everyone to find you, seek you out, ask more questions, right? Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. That was wonderful. Um, we now have time for a networking break um, and we have a speed networking session. So this is a chance to connect with anyone one on one um, and other attendees that are online today. Uh, and during speed networking, the attendees are automatically matched uh, based on interest. And to access this, you'll just want to go into the speed networking like we did earlier click on the networking button on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and in this networking room, you can see a list of recommended connections. And if you prefer to use this time for one-on-one -on -one meetings with selected attendees, you can do that as well. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Anastasia. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks, guys.